my dear Dinesh, Partho, Joseph, Adrian, and all dear friends, a lot of whom are here, whom I'm extremely happy to meet. Uh, one of the important achievements of this meeting, which I already see happening here, is to have people like Ravi Marotra here, uh, who represent physical sciences. Some are there from natural sciences. And I wish there would be more scientists, scientists who do experiments in the lab who would engage with this community and begin to see their role, role in new ways and help the social scientists understand how some of the new models of hardcore material innovations are emerging from the labs of science. What Ravi has done, I'm sure he's going to talk about it at some stage, but what he has done is wonderful. He distributed a problem which he identified as a very crucial one, which is to make an affordable ECG in 5,000 rupees. Among about 28 students, am I right? 28 students, he modelized the problem, gave it to 28 students in different modules, put them together, and you had an ECG machine with the specs which are better than the GE machine in many respects, more accuracy, uh, much more uh, robustness under different conditions. And our distributed minds could produce a product better and cheaper and more efficient than one of the largest corporations having the largest R&D system in the world. Now, this is a statement which needs underlining because this potential was always there. It is not something new. But we have suppressed this potential for a long time. Let me go back and share with you some of the lessons I have learned over this last two and a half decades. And uh, maybe those lessons have a bearing on what we do in this group. The first lesson is that urge to create theoretical models which will then help shape the habits of thought is not going to be easy. In 1987, we had a conference in Sussex on Farmers First. There was a revisit meeting a few years ago. And I said, we did a mistake. We should have talked about, at least now, labor first. There has not been a single follow-up move at the international level or for that matter in the Sussex or anywhere else on understanding the creativity of laborers or the working class. Now, if this realization has to dawn, and I'll give you examples, outstanding examples of what I have learned from the working of the laborers, both in the field and the farm and the workshops, which demonstrate their potential if they are given a chance. But this will not happen if we continue to fit our models in the constructs that have been produced elsewhere. Now, it might look parochial, it might look hackneyed, but I must still say that the urge to create new categories of thought will also require new politics, new institutional arrangements, new ways of engagement with each other and with the institutions around the world. Stuart MacDonald did a wonderful research. He went to one of the counties in England and looked at the data on the notices put up in the newspaper for selling slaves in the early 19th century. And he found something very interesting. He found that some slaves were sold at that time by their masters on account of their innovative ability to develop new equipments and new applications. So they, will, they mentioned in their notice that the slave so-and-so has this build, this kind of uh, you know, height, the weight, and whatever. And now it may look uh, tragic to talk of human beings in that language, but the fact is that these are, this is a historical record. And there's only one paper. Only one paper that I could lay my hands on so far. There must be many more. But for some strange reason, there's a silence in the academic world on discovering evidence about how, even under condition of slavery, when innovative potential of the workers could be appreciated and taken note of in the market of slaves at that time, how come that in the democratic society, in the post-independent system, most societies have forgotten to keep track and understand and celebrate and leverage the innovative potential of the workers. I met one worker in a farm of uh, innovator Ali Bhai in Jamnagar. His name was Wala, young boy of 16 years. One of my colleagues, Ria Sina, was doing her PhD works. She's still finishing her work. So as a part of that work, she was doing a case study, and we were talking to this worker. And he made a statement which I had never heard before. Coming from agriculture science background, it was something I had never been taught, I had never studied. 
He said, sir, you know, there are two kinds of irrigation, fast irrigation and slow irrigation. I said, what? Fast irrigation and slow irrigation. He said, yes, when chili crop is young, the seedlings have been just transplanted, it has a very shallow root system. If you give fast irrigation, it will get uprooted. So what do you do? So you make beds bigger. So the water spreads slowly. And that's called slow irrigation. And then there is a opposite of that is a fast irrigation. Now I had never heard about, but it's very scientific, you know, that the speed, the velocity with which water moves, obviously will have a bearing on the growth and the uh, settlement of the seedlings in the field. There are a large number of such examples, which are waiting to be conceptualized and categorized by the scholars, but which are taking place anyway in the, mark, in the field and which are calling for a rethink on the understanding that we have of the innovation systems. Much of the literature on the national innovation system, as you all know, converts R&D equal to innovation, which even in the Western world is no more true. You all must have read the speech of PNG chairman who said a few years ago that by 2012, next year, more than 60 percent of the ideas for the new products and services will come from people outside the organization. G has, G chair has said that last year, which means the large corporations are beginning to realize the limits of what internal R&D can do to trigger new products and services. When they are realizing it, for a public system, for an institution, for a country to say that they will only be able to produce new innovations in formal sector is absurd, does not make any sense. So there is a rethinking which is required in the very framework of understanding and articulating innovations at national, international and uh, regional level. Uh, there is an interesting aside as to how do societies deal with problems and I will now begin with a limitation of the grassroots innovation system. Most of you are familiar with what we do. We look for crazy people who have not got education much, who have not got any formal training, but who have solved problems through their own genius. And the latest count, we had about 150, 160,000 such bits of knowledge from 545 districts of this country. So if an evidence was needed, it is available in eloquent, to an eloquent extent that there is a tremendous creativity available in this country. But there are some limits of this knowledge. And one of the first limits that I would like to share with you is that there are problems which even the grassroots innovators ignore. When I say this, I say this with uh, great uh, self-critical, uh, deep self-critical reflection because uh, it looks painful that certain problems must be neglected even by the grassroots innovators. Why would that happen? How does that happen is important to understand. And naturally, as you can imagine, the problems in which women are engaged are the ones which are the slowest to change when it comes to technological innovation system. How do we tackle that problem? One, of course, is to understand that this bias is not unique to India or developing countries. Autumn Stanley wrote a book which unfortunately most people have not read for whatever reasons. I'm sure most people here have not read that book, but it's a book which everybody should read. She wrote a book called as Mothers and Daughters of Invention. She spent 13 years of her scholarly life in writing this book, analyzing 200 years data of patent in USPTO. What did she find? She found that by early 80s, the contribution of women in explicit form was only about 2% in the database of USPTO, which had gone up to late 80s, early 90s by about 8%. Why would it be so? And then she goes and answers some of these questions that it is not that women don't invent, but many times they are deferential and give their names of husband in USA as the inventor rather than putting their own name. And uh, you all know how many complex technologies, Babbage, the computer system itself, the Jacquard system of the looms and large number of such very complex technologies were developed by women inventors who did not have at that time professional training or workshops at their disposal. In India, the situation is not very different. Unfortunately, women tend to cope rather than transient. And one of the models that we need to now invent is transient model of innovation where some people for some reason somehow are able to overcome the limits that the culture and institutions put on the entrepreneurial or on the experimental ethic of the individual or the community. So if all the tea that you will take at the tea break is picked manually by women from the top of the bushes, 
put, make, make, plucking it like this, putting their hand like this. Now, if you do that 2,000 times, 3,000 times, you will have pain in your shoulder. And this pain has been there for last few hundred, at least hundred and odd years, till the, when the British introduced tea gardens in this country. Has there been any device which has been developed? No. If at all you go to the net, you will find some scissors. Now, scissor is not a way of plucking tea. Please understand that. Tea birds have to be picked up one at a time. The quality of tea depends upon the nature of selection that you make in the birds. So you cannot just cut with a scissor. That is what you will find. That is the farthest that the imaginative mind of the science and technology community around the world has gone so far to address this problem. The rice that you will eat at the lunch time, 99% of it is transplanted manually. We still do not have very good manual transplanters which a worker can afford without having to put feet under the water for 10 days and uh, uh, you know, getting fungal infections and all the problems that you have in backbend culture. I can go on. But the point is that there are a large number of such problems which our society did not even benchmark, forgot about solving them. So in 12th five-year plan, one of the efforts that we are making with the DST is to take note and put on record that these state problems we will not live with unsolved indefinitely anymore. We have to get to them. So we are suggesting a program called a Chinati, which is challenging and unfolding and augmenting the innovative innovations for technological innovations for society, where society should throw up a challenge to anybody and everybody who can offer solutions to this problem with which India would not live any longer. In 1929, 1929, Mahatma Gandhi announced a competition. A competition was announced for redesigning the spinning wheel. And he gave the specifications of the final product. It should weigh so much, it should have so much count, it should have uh, so much productivity, it should work, the person should not have this drudgery. All the conditions, the boundary conditions of what the final product should satisfy was given. It was one of the best uh, written, on, written document on how a technological challenge should be announced. 7,000 pound was the award, which at that time was 1 lakh rupees. Current value minimum with all the adjustment that you may take is about 10 crores. We don't have a single award, forget about 10 crore, or even 1 crore, even 50 lakhs for solving a problem with which we have, our society has been living on for such a long time. So this is likely to change, hopefully. Let us see. When the document will come out, we'll see. At this moment, we are making an effort that the country should not live with these problems any longer unsolved. So the biases that exist sometimes. Now, why did women could, didn't solve this problem themselves? One, culturally, they were denied the tools of blacksmithy and carpentry. They were not allowed to use those tools. So if they had tools at their disposal, they did wonderful technologies and found solutions. In this recent show, Yatra, we met Tola Devi, a dai, a midwife, in Hajam village in Ranchi. And she said, when you deliver a child, three things must be remembered. One. Umbilical cord must not be cut for at least 10 minutes till it is pulsating. Now, you know, in doctors in hospitals will cut it immediately. It gives a shock. Child may develop fear and it is not very healthy. Second, the delivery must not be done in a very lighted environment. The infant the, in the womb, you had, the child has remained in very dark environment. Suddenly, you expose the eyes, even if they are closed with the light, it affects his eyesight. He said, look at the children that I have delivered, have they got specks on their eyes? And look at nowadays, a lot of children getting a lot of specks in early age. Third, the squatting or the declining position is much better delivered than the lying position for which the beds in India have been imported from, the, from Western countries. And they are continuing to be used in our delivery system, delivery halls. Now, this lady is talking about science, hardcore principle. She is saying when pulsating, pulsation is taking place in the umbilical, umbilical cord, the child is taking nutrition. There is a time which takes for him or her to be self-reliant as an entity in this world. You cannot cut short that time. Now, we need to, of course, do properly exper proper experiments, set it up. But how do we do experiments? We can only now do, we can do observation trials of those who are following this practice and those who are not following this practice and then see what the outcomes are. But the fact remains that people who have this knowledge are challenging, have challenged. But somehow the ascentist system has not responded to these challenges for such a long time. Time has come that we should pay attention to these 
challenges in a rigorous scientific dispassionate manner. Just because Tula Devi says it or X, Y, Z says it should not make a difference to the way, the rigor with which we will evaluate the claims and establish them in a most rigorous scientific language. On that no compassion. I would not expect any consideration to be shown for a hypothesis whether it generates in the field or generates in the lab. Hypothesis deserve the same scrutiny, same rigor that any other hypothesis will deserve. The second issue that we have uh, come across when we were looking at the biases, what limitations, we found that many times the science of the technological innovation does not get adequately articulated. Obviously, because the farmers or the artisans would not know the science as much, uh, they would have their own language to articulate that, but the formal institutional scientist can do research and articulate that. And that is why I believe that the science underlying these technologies must be uh, articulated, must be identified and established and again in a rigorous manner. For instance, there was a plant which was used in Orissa by a tribal community for ripening fruits. Now, you all know that on fruit ripening there is a big hue and cry because carbide is used and this is not good for health. A lot of in Gujarat, a lot of raids are taking place, a lot of mangoes are being destroyed because they harm. Now, the fact that they harm has been known to Indian medical science for a long time. It is not a new discovery. The fact that they use certain chemicals for ripening fruit which are not safe for our health is also known to the scientific community for a long time. Enough work exists. So, it is not something for which we need to do a new experiment to prove. It is already proved. But the institutions which have to use this finding from the lab and convert into a public policy instrument have not really responded for a long time. So, now they responded. But what about the alternatives by which you will replace these? Now, that is there the research has not been done. So, we gave this plan to CFTRI, Central Food and Technology Research Institute in Mysore and asked them to do research on it <coughs> under the chairpersonship of at that time of Dr. Kumar of ISC, very eminent scientist of our country. So, when CFTRI did, CFTRI did the research, they found two very interesting things. One, when you ripen the fruit with this plant, the ratio of the reducing to non-reducing sugar changes in the fruit. Now, certain kinds of sugar are useful for our health, certain kinds of sugars are not useful for our health. It increases the proportion of useful sugars vis-a-vis -vis the non-useful sugars. Apart from the fact that it also ripens them better and therefore, the fruits taste better, they ripen better, they are healthier and the technology is very low cost. Therefore, the innovation that we are talking about some people use the word extreme affordability, some people use the word frugal innovations, various terms are being used, does not matter what term you use, but the fact remains that if we want to produce not only good innovations, but also good science underlying these innovations, which will then be used for many other applications, because scientific knowledge has an advantage that it can be applied to many more applications beyond the domain where it originated, that is the advantage of science, whereas in technology it may be circumscribed in many cases by the domain in which it originates. So, it will be very nice and useful to therefore focus on how do we understand and articulate the science underlying the technologies and therefore I increase the sp speed, the scale at which these technologies will get applied in different domains. It could be material science research. Uh, once we were doing a, we had a workshop like in, uh, uh, mid 80s in Karnataka, Shimoga among the carpenters and blacksmiths. You, they have wooden plow. In wooden plow, what happens that wood is now becoming scarce. Acacia species is not as many as often found. The trees are not found. So, the wood when it gets worn out, the shear gets worn out, they wanted to put a metallic shoe on it. So, a wooden plow with a metallic shoe, shear will be metallic. Now, they began a material science research. So, the fellow, the farmer who did the innovation went around and tried to look for materials which will be suitable. And after all the testing and uh, analysis using his heuristics in his mind, he found that the suspension springs, the leaf springs in the automobile have the material, the iron, the right torque, the light weight. It is light in weight, high in torque and that is the quality he needed in that shoe. So, he made shoes out of that material. Now, they did a material science research. I do not know whether we would have been able to discover such a material characteristic by going through the uh, linear search that we do most often in scientific lab, we may or may not have found that material so easily as he did by looking at certain conditions that he had in his mind and he have evaluated different materials in the junkyard 
on those conditions and found this material. So, whether it is material, whether it is method or whether it is application, the three parameters in the matrix, one of them should be new for a process or a product to be called as innovative. Uh, old method, old material used for new application. So, for example, uh, aspirin has been known to be a drug for headache. When it was used as blood thinner, that was new application. It became new innovation, it became an innovation. So, old molecule, old material, old method, new application that became an innovation. As a directing, old method, old compound, new application growing hairs on the body head, there is a patent on that. Innovation or a storage stable compound by changing the method for pesticide, which is old application, old compound is an innovation. So, it is not difficult to develop a taxonomy by which we can identify innovative spirit of our society, the challenge is to see how this spirit can be harnessed, nurtured and given a space in our intellectual dialogues that we take place and not decry these efforts of producing high quality technological solutions sometime with underlying high quality science as well. Let me just share now some of the models that are emerging from our work and which may be of interest and you might like to critique them. One of the model I call is uh, inverted model of innovation. Now, this has been spawned by our work with children. So, every year we have a competition called as Ignite competition, where we invite ideas from children for new products, new processes, improvement in existing product, existing processes or utopia. And you will not believe that we are getting, coming across some outstanding technologies. The last year, the youngest child who got an award Ignite Award at the hand of Dr. Kalam was class 1 from Tamil Nadu, Krishananth. All this, the booklets are available at nifindia.org for free download, so you can download them. And imagine if a child of class 1 can conceptualize a new idea, just he had a dialogue with his father who sent us the dialogue and we just thought it was so magnificent that a child can conceptualize so well at this age and develop a new idea. We then, so what do do? Children imagine, engineers and designers fabricate and companies commercialize. That is the inverted model of innovation. So, a girl of class 8th, 9th, Nisha Chaube, finds that when you go to railway station or bus stand, you have a stroller with you, no place to sit. She says, why can't we have a folding seat in this stroller? A design company now is developing this stroller with a folding seat and future group with which we have signed an MOU last December will market it. This will only happen in this country and probably in other countries once we realize that children have no inhibition in imagination. I will share with you more examples of children, just two or three examples to show you how powerful this model is. In this show, the Atra, we met a boy of class 7, Muhammad Sajid Ansari, class 7. His house was demolished in the anti-encroachment drive in Ranchi city a few days back. So, he now lives 15 kilometers away. He spends two hours to go to the school one way. He found his mother, as all of us have seen our mothers, generally not father, cleaning the rice. So, there are two issues when you thresh, when you husk the rice, there are some grains which are full, some are broken and there are also impurities in the rice. So, you need to remove the impurities when you cook the rice and if you have to sell it, you need to separately sell the small one and the big one. Otherwise, if you mix, sell it in mixed form, the value of the entire lot is lesser. If you segregate it, the value goes up. He has designed a working model, working machine, which separates the full grains from the impurities. A rice sort, tabletop rice sorting machine in 2000 rupees, class 7, Mamba Sajid Ansari, whose father is a tailor and he takes the sewing machine on a cart and stitches, stitches cloths in going from street to street. So, you cannot imagine more hard life for a child and in that hardship, he did not give up, he did not just live with the problem that all of us have done. My generation, I must say, cannot be forgiven for the fact that we learned to live with problems unsolved indefinitely. We knew these problems, we had seen our mothers, we did not get bothered by these. New generation, I must say, a very promising quality of this new generation is that it is asking questions about more and more problems which they would like to solve. So, this is an, uh, what I call as inverted model of innovation. Second is empathetic innovation. Empathetic innovations are those which are triggered by someone when he sees a third party problem, not his own, not her own. I have five minutes more. 
And what would this person do then? He will see the problem and say, all right. So, Khemji Bhai one day receives some women who come and say, look, Khemji Bhai, our neck gets pain because of the uh, water that we carry on our head. Uh, can you not think about some solution? And he says, but the head was not designed to carry load. It was designed to think. And they tease, they say that, look, you're teasing us. You know our problem. And he designs a very simple device, which is yet to be perfected by the designers, which is a ring on two support on the shoulder, which is a one centimeter above the head when you put the shoulder rest, so that the load is transferred to shoulder from the head. So you don't have pain in the neck anymore. It's not a good solution, but it is an improvement over what the conditions were before. Is it trivial? Some people might think it is trivial. I don't think it is trivial. A problem which affects millions of women and causes pain in their neck and the back because of the load that they carry on their head. If it shifts the load in a manner that it reduces the pain and makes the life more bearable, it cannot be trivial. Like that, there are a large number of other innovations which have been triggered by third party problem, not one's own. And of course, there are a lot of innovations which have been developed by people to solve their own problem very large number of them. Having said that, what are the new uh, platforms at which we can create new potential of our new potential to unfold the, the creative uh, energy of our society? One of these platform was created two years ago by a young boy who works with us now, Hiran Mai Mahanta, called as techpedia.in. Techpedia.in has 100,000 engineering projects by, done by 350,000 students all in open source, you can access that. So if you want to know who is doing what on RFID or on laser or machine language, any problem of engineering, you can just press, write that problem and you will find who is guiding, who has guided which project to which students, where. So we have mapped the mind of three and a half lakh students. There are about 10 lakh students, a million students every year who do engineering projects. This country didn't care about what happened to these projects for the last 60 years. There cannot be more callous loss, more uh, greater indifference to the potential of young people to solve problems. So what are we trying to do? Dr. Ravi is involved in that partnership with CSIR. We're trying. Let us hope that someday it will happen. So far, we are supporting it from our own resources with no money from government. We are trying to map MSMEs in various clusters to all the engineering faculty. Gujarat, it has been done. In fact, Gujarat Technical University has introduced a course of four credit in summer for defining the problem of MSME, eight credits for trying to solve it in the final year project. So first time, there are about 12 credit to a student to deal with a real life problem. And they can also take up problem of their own mind or problem of informal sector. So MSME is not obligatory, but it is one of the sources. If this happens, you can imagine what will be the scope of innovative potential when we will engage our young minds, young technology minds with the problem for our society. So there are new platforms that are emerging and we will have to create many more such platforms where a youthful nation, we always take pride in saying India is one of the youngest country. And at the same time, when it comes to science and technology policy, when it comes to innovation systems, we don't engage with them. This is a platform where we are engaging with them. And all of you are welcome to mentor such students, to pick up, and you will now discover the new hotbeds of creativity. So, for example, you will not know that a black box for automobile, now the car which Tata drives and the car which Mohan Kumar Mangaram Birla drives does not have a black box. Black box will be very useful for the manufacturer of the car to understand the feedback on different terrains, how the car performs. It will also be useful for insurance sector to find out whose mistake it was when the accident takes place. So, black box can be a very useful thing. But there is no car which has a black box. Four girls Sally and others, in women polytechnic, government women polytechnic in Latour have developed this black box. If you write this on the tech video, you will find out. What does it mean? It means that in small towns, in the small institutions, so-called small people, small teachers are guiding problems, innovative challenges, which the big minds in the big institution like mine, where I teach, and others are not able to address. So there's a new India which is emerging which is in small towns, small institutions, small localities, and who do not aspire to go abroad. They want to remain in this country because they, they, they know that is, that's all they can do. And they have to prove themselves because that's the only way they can survive in this world. 
And since they have much less to lose, they are very innovative. <laughs> they are very risk taking a lot of risk. So let me close by saying that we need to develop new indicators in the next five-year plan and in our academic community, which will help us track the trends, both of indifference and of engagement of the SNT community with the larger social problems. These indicators must be unambiguously measurable, at least in some cases, whether qualitative or quantitative. And the data on these indicators, and NISTAR is in a very good position because they have been doing this work for a long time. But the indicators that we have developed so long did not provide this information adequately in terms of engagement of society with the unsolved problems of our society. New indicators are required, therefore. Second issue is when it comes to sustainability, obviously the problems which have long-term solution, which require longitudinal research, which where the experiments are, the oldest experiment in forestry is in Sweden, 400 years, four rounds of four cycles, four cycles of forestry. And it has conclusively proved that managed forests, every cycle, have less productivity than before. Conclusively proved. The longest cycle of experiment that has been done. In this country, we don't even have such experiments. So forget about developing theories of tropical forestry, which will help us understand how to manage planted forest in tropical environments for long-term sustainability. So the hardcore issues are there, which we need to address in different disciplines, in different domains. And for this, indi indicators need to be developed. Uh, lastly, let me say that the engagement that National Innovation Foundation, Honeybee Network, and Srashti and all other bodies have done with the masses of our country, we are going to scale it up in the coming few years. Two crore people, 20 million people travel by train every day. Our aspiration is to engage with them. There are one lakh post offices in this country. Our aspiration is to get to every village of this country through a post office. The most credible government functionary is postman whose integrity is beyond doubt. We want to engage with them. So we have plans. Now, obviously, one NIF, one institution, few people cannot achieve that. It requires a huge network of people, public supported people, who will join this effort in both taking learning from the people and also sharing with them the good science. Uh, for those of you who may not be from health background, it may shock you, but for the rest, know it very well. 50% children under the age of five are malnourished in this country. In Gujarat, which is one of the most developed states, growth rate is about 10.6% for last more than 10 years, has 47% children malnourished. Hardly 35% women in Gujarat feed their children in the first two hours or first day cholesterol milk. Cholesterol milk. Even those practices which are very simple, science-based, have not reached the masses. Forget about the new technologies, new innovations. So there's a great deal of task to be done. Growth by itself is very important, will provide generates resources, but the fact is that it doesn't, by, it doesn't automatically address the problem of inclusive development. So thank you so much and all the best for this workshop.